underwater you were thrown that suddenly changes its oh appearance like apartment. a ghost into a monster of into what our subconscious thinks should be in there. Of you know, kind of like a UFO dog. That's it right there, man. Like, what if these things can simply alter their appearance? What if these things can simply appear at will? Like, there, there's bizarre stories of Bigfoot vanishing into thin air. Um, like, there's lots of these stories, and that's what's so strange about it. Like, I don't think, I, I think that if Bigfoot was completely physical, it was an ape that lived in the woods around the clock, and it was a real physical thing like a grizzly bear or um, a moose. I'm convinced that there would have been bones discovered by now. There yeah. would have been something uh, there would have been a body found, uh, a burial or something. I think that these things are slightly ethereal, slightly uh, out of phase from the rest of this reality. That works. As weird as that sounds, I know. <laughs> but it's exactly true because it's the only way to describe this phenomenon. These are like some kind of it's some kind of. Uh, phenomenon which isn't quite fitting into our time no. <laughs> but it's sort of it's sort of there but not there as as uh, not as much as we are here um well, well i listen to um i listen to a podcast on a cast box which is just basically an app you put on your phone you can carry around the uh podcasts and i have downloaded probably about uh 60 expanded perspectives uh podcasts and the, the stuff that they'll talk about in Expanded Perspectives is some of the most wild, wacky stuff you've ever heard. I, I just remember the other day working, listening to this, uh, a woman in, I think it was Illinois, said that she was going for a walk and in the bushes she heard like a noise and she looked over and she saw in the bushes, she saw a saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> And she said she was like absolutely terrified. But what was the most bizarre thing about it to her was she said that only she could only see half of the saber tooth tiger different. I think it was like the lower one side of its body was kind of like shape, like it was kind of like uh, it, like it wasn't really so much there. It was like half the body was missing. It was like almost like she was seeing into a time thousands tens of thousands of years ago when saber two tigers used to roam the continent and she was seeing literally a ghost of a saber two tiger doing its thing thousands of years ago i just <laughs> i i know it's nuts man i know dude i know how crazy hey, that, stuff is. that sort of story is quite common uh if you look into the the whole UFO literature, this time travel thing and the whole ghost thing, there's, there's, there's so much time travel going on. And I often wonder, do people uh, go missing? You know, it's also, as you know, probably it's an ancient Irish tale. The guy wanders too close to the fairy mound and then he vanishes and then he comes back a thousand years later and he says, whoa, everything's changed, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, like uh, some of the leprechaun stories are some of the most fascinating ones, like where people ha have tried to grab on to leprechauns and the leprechaun has to take them into their little lair and then they uh, see a pile of gold and the leprechaun tells them, OK, you see the sun sh uh, falling right now. You can take as much gold as you can grab. Uh, but if you stay in here until the sun goes down over that window, uh, you're going to be trapped in here forever. And so the guy started trying to grab as much gold as he could. His shirt, like he tried to fill up gold into like his shirt and he tied it in like a big knot and his shirt ripped. And eventually he was able to grab a few handfuls and he jumped out uh, the, the, the leprechaun's house right before the door sealed and he would have been shut in there forever. You know, the, like, the, the leprechaun story, and and I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry, my internet crashed. I had to reset my whole router and and whatnot. Oh shoot, man. Yeah, we figured. Yeah, Amy said that. Um, the leprechaun story with the rainbow with the pot of gold. The gold represents the sun, and you don't get a rainbow without sunlight. So, we anthropomorphize everything. Even cats and dogs. I mean, if you have cats and dogs, how many times have you looked at your spouse 
and the dog is giving you a funny look and you and you talk to your spouse as though you're speaking for the dog right it's like well i didn't do it you know what i mean <laughs> you make funny voices and we talk for our animals we anthropomorphize everything it's human nature and i remember charles you might remember this when i was traveling and my wife and i went up to devil's tower wyoming and we, we you you were on the show you, we interviewed yeah. you and you, uh, about uh, Devil's Tower, um, there's a, a a Native American legend around Devil's Tower that has to do with seven sisters, seven maiden girls, Indian maiden girls, who they were being chased by a bear, and the legend is that they climbed up on top of this hill or mound. And to escape this bear. And some Native American god rescued them by raising the hill up into the sky, away from the bear. And as the bear clawed his way, tried to get to these girls, that's what created the striations, the stripes or the lines of the Devil's Tower monument. And... And I'm reading this literature pamphlet while I'm there, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, wait a minute. And I went back, and I started reading from the beginning, and it said there were seven girls. And I went, oh, seven, huh? Boom. Pleiades. Done and done. So they, So they anthropomorphized a story to explain what they didn't understand about the tower and how it related to something in the sky, the, and, and the young maiden girls, they were trapped up there because it was so tall and they couldn't get down, and they eventually became part of the heavens, which became the Pleiades, the seven stars. And so it's all an anthropomorphized version, one after another after another. So literally everything that happens on Earth or in the sky, particularly the sky, because that's... Again, that was their HBO, like I mentioned earlier. I mean, the sun, the moon, they didn't understand. Ancient people, they didn't understand. They didn't understand gravity. They didn't understand electricity. They didn't understand uh, planetary physics. They didn't understand comets. They didn't understand asteroids. Rocks fell from the sky. Uh, earthquakes happened. Volcanoes happened. They didn't understand. Everything was anthropomorphized. Everything became something from the gods. The gods were angry. The gods were happy. The gods gave us good crops. The gods ruined our crops. The gods were pissed off. We did something wrong. Maybe we should sacrifice more children. <laughs> you know, everything, yeah. everything became a religion based on anthropomorphized stuff that they didn't understand. Well, I just think, truthfully when it comes to reality, the universe and everything, I just truthfully 100% believe we simply cannot comprehend the true nature of the universe. Our primitive science is so backwards in com it's so far off from how complex the universe really is. It's like it's like us listening to druids uh, thousands of years ago trying to explain to us like the drill like I, I always say this our modern scientists in their white lab in our in their white lab coats are like the druids from thousands of years ago so the druids with their white cloaks and our scientists from modern times are the same exact thing white cloaked uh, believers that they have the ultimate knowledge of the universe whereas right right now we are at a such a primitive state of evolution we're like monkeys trying to comprehend rocket science and that's how little we understand about how the universe truly is it, it, we're like in an infantile my, state my thought on that is that absolutely we are highly advanced However, we are beset by psychopaths who are in control and maintain control by hiding most of the things that would help humanity understand what's going on. I truly don't believe there is a uh, superior as they would like the common person to perceive them as. I don't believe that they're as 
all-knowing as they'd like people to think. Well, aside from the fact that there are, you know, I mean, I know they've got electrogravitics in Black Projects. Oh, certainly, yeah. Okay, so I know that they've got tons of science that they don't let us have. And if I was a psychopath and I had all the money in the universe, I'd want to maintain control of everything. And I wouldn't let them have most of the stuff that I have, including understanding. In fact, I would do my best to send them on wild goose chases in, and, you know, maybe pay somebody to pump a theory as a mad scientist sort of guy that was a theory that had enough in it that things could, th some things could be made to work, but it wouldn't work completely and it wouldn't predict, say, free energy and uh, maybe give it to somebody who was, oh, I don't know, a patent clerk or something, you know, find somebody like that, put him in the role of mad scientist, tell him to espouse these theories that I gave him because I know that they'd be just workable enough that people wouldn't question them a whole lot. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, I'd have the truth. <laughs> And I would know what was really going on. And in fact, according to Paula Violette, in Black Projects, they do use a physics that is very different from the one that is out in the open. And uh, it does include an ether. So, <laughs> I don't know. I'm thinking we've got a lot more understanding, some of us than you might think. And it, the reports are that they are at least 50 years and uh, some people say as much as 100 to 150 years more advanced than what they let us have. Yeah, I'm convinced that a lot of that stuff that you hear, like, oh my God, they're like, a, they're many thousand, like there's the one, of course, there's the case of the guy who was like, I think he was like the president or CEO of um, Lockheed Martin. He said something along the lines of, we we can build the same things that E.T. can uh, at the moment. Yeah, we can take E.T. home, uh, I think. We, <laughs> we can take E.T. home. I think more so what that would be would be like a misinformation and basically simple bullshit to fuck with the Russians and the Chinese. Well, I, I no, because I, I, I'll tell you something. The Russians and the Chinese are under governments, which are corporations, which are owned by the same people that own the United States Corporation and the Australian Corporation and the Canadian Corporation and the... Yeah, and, and, we got it. You know, just fill in the blank. But they keep about the, the divisions to keep us divided, to keep us conquered and focusing on fighting each other rather than you know, at their impetus, I might add, uh, rather than trying to do something about them. Well, we're all busy playing catch up. Well, yeah. You guys, well, you guys, it's ten. It's ten o'clock, and uh, we got to say uh, to everyone, we apologize for the uh, shenanigans. Uh, we. It was a good show, though, the first uh, bit there until the very I, I, end. I don't think they're hearing any of this, dear. We're offline. No, we're no, not we... offline. There's, there's, oh. No, we're not offline. We're back oh. online, and right now... Uh, I had no idea. I did not know. Yeah, they're coming back in. We're, we're, we're back up to... T we're, we're up to 12 watching right now live, so... We had, oh, well, we, cool. we had almost 40 watching live. Um, yeah, I so, saw I, I actually saw 40 briefly once. So we were doing all right. And unfortunately, everybody, I lost my internet and I had to restart my router. Charles, thank you so much for being with us. And if you've got a few more minutes, Charles, if you're okay, um, I see you're unmuted. Are you? Is your microphone working? Can we hear you? Yeah, it, it, I think it's all right. Yeah. All right. Have you got a few more minutes? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll stick around. And thank you for having me. It's uh, it's been a real pleasure seeing you guys again, and um, and being on your awesome show. Thanks, man. Um, it's a pleasure to have you. You're again, you're one of my favorite people. I do want to go oh. over one or two more things that I didn't get to cover. Um, I've got a screen grab here, and oops, I need to go ahead and do a share. Uh, so that you guys can see what I'm doing and everybody else can see. So you should have my screen now. Yep. <clears throat> yep. Um, this is a screen grab that I took from your video, your most recent upload. You recognize this, yes? Indeed, yeah. And you were wondering about the, the glyphs on this artifact. Um, besides the fact that they look like runes, uh, besides the fact that this one over here on the right looks very Egyptian. Um, yes, it does. And obviously we've got a, a clear cross here and the others have very rune-ish nature to the, whatever they are. But I've got this one circled here in blue, which is the cross. And there are the three droplets coming out of this cross. And it stuck out to me. And again, I don't mean to, you know, uh, beat a dead horse. But as you can see, I've written Venus. It looks to me like that might be Venus. And that is because of this. This original symbol, which is the Native American uh, medicine wheel, otherwise known as a dream catcher. And that's exactly the same symbol, with a few extra arms. Uh, uh, you know, one has the four, and this one has eight. So the only real difference, where did it go? Where, where did the uh, thing go? Should be this one, yes. So there's that one, with the cross and the three drops, or three whatevers. And so there you go. You've got the cross. And it's the, got it's yeah. got that sort of square in there. What could that be? I don't know. But when I saw that, I thought to myself, well, I have seen that symbol before. And it only took me about two minutes to find it. And it's the medicine wheel. It's the dream catcher. They could all be based on an ancient alphabetic letter as well, which is also which also could be the uh, that uh, the Venus representation because uh, alchemy symbols appear to be an alternate kind of alphabet, which, as we know, is based on planets. And alchemy symbols, Mars, Jupiter, and all these planets in alchemy. So, uh, and how old are alchemy symbols as well? Like they, they seem to be incredibly ancient, but they only really pop up in medieval texts, but they're based on earlier uh, Hebrew texts, um, earlier alternate Bibles. And you see the alchemy symbols also in ancient Rome and ancient cultures. It's another alphabet we don't know about, maybe a top secret alphabet. There was something else I wanted to share with you from your video. Um, I think it's this one here. A very darkened image. A screen grab that I took from your video. Uh, today's video. And you said, you kept saying he. He has breasts. He is holding these weapons or whatever. Um, this is Venus. This is Kali. Look at the multiple arms coming out of this thing. Yeah, at the time I presumed it was a picture of Yakwe, but it, obviously it being on a moon, well, Yakwe was a, a moon god as well, but being on the moon is, is kind of a feminine thing that usually the moon is the mother. So I, you, you might be right. It, it's a kind of horned Kali weird thing, but a Western version of it. And... Um, yeah, crazy. And also staff god as well. Uh, so, yeah. Right. Right. Um, there was something else that was associated. It might have been this one here. 
Uh, this is the upper portion of that same tablet you were looking at. Now, this to me is a dead giveaway. These two images right here, top dead center, are a dead giveaway. This yeah. is Venus. This is the star. This is the Astara. Ashtar. Ishtar. This, Astarte. Astarte. This, on the right side, is quite clearly Uhura Mazda. This is the winged serpent, the winged disc. I recognize those two right off the bat. So, I don't know if you are picking up on what I'm seeing, but I will very quickly, I'll just pull up an image of Uhura Mazda. Let me get up to where I can type. Fire and sun also, is also resurrection. Um, it's, uh, yeah. There's a Hura Mazda right there. The wing disc, which I also think might be related to Venus. So this is the Zoroastrian god, Ahura Mazda. And if you'll notice, these two spirally legs that come down out of the bottom left and the bottom right. Uh, there we go, yeah. Which are Again. almost a dead giveaway for the images that I showed a little while ago. So you can see there, that's Ahura Mazda, right? You can see this. Yeah, it, it could well be. It could well be. And where did they go? It was in the other folder right here. That's that's those, these guys right there. Those are the spirals that right there. Yeah the spirally arms coming out of it. So if you just literally just flip that image upside down, then the spiral arms come down and out rather than up and out. So it really kind of depends on where you are on Earth and how you observe this thing in the sky. And you were mentioning the, the, the skulls on the top images. And again, they have the spirals and they're flaming coming out of the skull and they're almost like a cometary tail and yet we've got the spiral tendrils and the flames which are all indicative of the serpent, the winged dragon, the feathered serpent, the disheveled hair, the fiery serpent and it, those are all to me uh, symbols of the comet. We have a skull with the fire flames, hairy stuff coming out the backside. Yep, those are fiery serpent, serpent representations for sure. For sure. One other thing I wanted to show you, Charles. Um, at 14 minutes in your video, not one other, I got maybe another two or three that I want to show you. This is a screen grab from your video today. Um, remind us, remind me, what, what, what exactly? This is Egypt, obviously. You can see the Egyptian eyes at the very top there, Eye of Ra, the top center. Um, you thought, I mean, what, this was maybe a casing stone? And, and you were trying to interpret these images here. And you said in your video that these are shafts of wheat. Did you say that in your video? I'm pretty sure you said. Yeah. Okay. This guy in the middle, I would bet my life that that right there is Ophiuchus. The constellation Ophiuchus. Here's why I say this. First, we've got the stars down here on the bottom right, which, represent, which tell you clearly that whatever you're looking at is in the sky. This is a starry, a sky thing. This is a constellation. This is happening in the sky because of the representations of the stars. 
The reason this is Ophucus is because of this serpent figure right here that goes right across his midsection. Okay, both of his arms, one to the right and one to the left. And then we've got this serpent which cuts right across his midsection. This, Charles, let me show you this. This is a screen grab that I took from Stellarium. I don't know if you have this. This is a fantastic, absolutely fantastic software package. It's free. That's Ophucus. That's the wrestler. He wrestles the serpent. In Egypt, they had a tradition, you may be familiar since you do a lot of Egyptology. The, the Egyptians, they had a 360-day uh, solar year, and then they had a five-day period where they didn't take on any new endeavors, no business ventures, nobody did business, kind of like a festival period. It was a week-long festival. It was five days, which gave them the 365-day year that we have today. So they had 12 constellations, 12 months, and then Ophucus was the 13th, which was unlucky. That's why you didn't take on any new business ventures. Nobody bought and sold anything on during this time for a five-day period. And the 13th month in Egyptian uh, astronomy is represented by the constellation Ophucus, the wrestler. And he wrestles this giant serpent. And you look, see that serpent cuts right across his midsection there. One arm to the left, one arm to the right. Hmm. That's Ophucus. I'm almost certain, I would nearly bet my life, Charles, that this... Let me get to it. Where did it go? Oops. You still with me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't familiar with this uh, Ophiuchus character, actually. That's quite interesting. But all the Greek stuff is from Egypt. So it makes a lot of sense. So I'm going to have to look into this uh, mythology of this guy. Interesting. Yeah. This is Ophiuchus. He's the 13th constellation of the 13th month. And he represents um, the five-day period, which makes up the difference of the... Because they were on a, sexgest a sexagesimal system based on 6 and 12. Mm. So they had, a three, they had a 360-day year. And then they had a five-day period, which is kind of like a, a fill-in, like a leap year period, for five days. And it was represented by the 13th constellation known as Ophiuchus, which is the wrestler with this giant serpent. And when you said shaft of wheat, you said it looks like he's carrying shafts of wheat. And maybe your resolution is better than mine. It looks like he is carrying a shaft of wheat. Let me show you this. It's the same image from the same Stellarium package. Um, where did it go? Here we go. Okay. Ophiuchus sits right below Virgo. Mm -hmm. And Virgo which is the, represents the month of September, which is the beginning of the harvest month. She always carries a shaft of wheat. Oh. Yes, she does. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> because it's September. It's harvest time. Uh-huh. And... Well, I, I, yeah. no, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. I know it's wheat because it looks like the Egyptian letter E, which really is a shaft of wheat. Uh, so, and, and that kind of, that kind of looks like that. Um, so, so yeah. I'm telling you, Charles, this, this astrology stuff, there's really something to it. Watch this. Oh, Astrotheology. It's all the same. Astrotheology, astrology, look at it the way you want. Let me show you this real quick. This, I'm going to pull up an image of the Virgin Mary. Because I have made the case Virgin Mary artwork images. I want to show you a couple of things and I think I showed you some of these when you and I spoke about astrotheology. It's extraordinarily often that you'll see the Virgin Mary with a dress or, or a cloak or a gown that is studded with stars. I mean, look at, look at her shawl. 
studded with stars. That's a dead giveaway. And look, the moon under her feet. And if you pay very, very, very close attention, there's a serpent somewhere under her feet. She almost mm -hmm. always tramples the serpent. Let me get a better one. That's true. So if you look at ancient or like Renaissance artwork of the Virgin Mary, there's a serpent under her feet. She's usually standing on the moon. She's usually associated with the moon. She's a moon goddess. Look at how often she's depicted with the moon. Let me get a better, like, Renaissance, not modern time stuff. Here we go. This is something. Here's decent. There's the serpent. She's trampling the serpent. She's standing on the moon and trampling the serpent. Mm. Again and again and again and again. Now, these are most of these are modern depictions. Let me go see if I can get uh, some Renaissance. Is there a constellation of this? It's Virgo. It's Virgo. It's Virgo, because Virgo... Is standing on the wrestler with the serpent. Virgo is, yes, Virgo... Oh, that's interesting. Virgo is, 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 is directly above Ophiuchus, which is the wrestler holding the serpent, and look, the serpent is right below her feet. Ha! Huh. There we go. So Very the Virgin nice. Mary is Virgo the Virgin. And that's why, I mean, if you look at like the Bible says Revelation, I think it's Revelation 12, um, says that she will be clothed with the sun and the moon at her feet. And here she is standing on the moon trampling a serpent. <laughs> the moon at her feet, trampling the serpent. That's the serpent of Ophiuchus. That's the constellation Virgo. So that explains it. Hmm. And you can just you can just repeat this process again and, and again and again and again and again. The Virgin Mary, standing on the moon, trampling a serpent. Almost every single time. I think this one, that one's actually cut off. This particular statue, there she is. Standing on the moon. And almost always a serpent snake under her feet. There she is, standing on the moon. Here she is in the clouds. And look under her feet. Look under her toes. There's a serpent right there. It's very obscure. And if you look even closer, this cherub has his hand on the tip of the moon. There's a little crescent moon poking out right there. It's all very obscure. This is not meant to be in your face. This is all obscure stuff. But it's always there. The moon at her feet trampling a serpent again and again. Somewhere I've got a folder with like a dozen or more of these images of the Virgin Mary. Time and time again, there she is in the clouds with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, oh look, 12. 12 cherubs. Those are the constellations. She's, <laughs> she's, she's in the clouds. Yeah, and she's at the center of the zodiac as well, it would seem. Like, uh, is Virgo, is Virgo up here? It's sort of, they're sort of on a wheel, aren't they? Well, in, in Egypt, the Egyptian astrology, they begin their astrology chart with, uh, with, with uh, Leo and it ends with Virgo, or the other way around. They begin <coughs> with Virgo and it ends with Leo. What do you make of that? We've got. Gridalian has oh. a picture of his result. Oh. Oh, over there? <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> I just had to point that out. 
why would you get her with that search? I have to wonder. Because I'm sure it's just a coincidence. Yeah, I'm sure. Hey, do you remember when, when I covered this? Greta is has been named the next uh, Vicar of Christ or something like that. The next. Yes. You, what was it they said? There was an article where the uh, Swedish church. I think it was named, the next incarnation the, the incarnation of christ or something like that oh yes. yeah oh yeah so she's like be about to be beatified or some shit oh yeah greta pfft. yeah greta is 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 jesus returned yeah i guess <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. so here's another one here's another one virgin mary standing on the moon trampling a serpent I mean, I could go. Over, I could spend an hour on this. That's the constellation Virgo. It is the constellation Virgo. I would bet my life on it. And, oops, what happened? I opened the wrong folder. I've often wondered about this myself because, in Poland, uh, being very Catholic, every museum, every church, you you see that that the, she's standing on the moon. And not all the time, but sometimes with the snake. And yes, she's surrounded by stars, showing she's up in the stars. Literally constellation. Yep. The Virgin Mary is the constellation Virgo. She's in the stars. She, her clothing is usually studded with stars. Her shawl is and usually star-studded. Doesn't, doesn't she appear occasionally with some wheat around her? Mm-hmm. She, I believe oh, so. Yes, thank you, Amy. Yes, thank you. That's an important. That's an important. Uh -huh. that's definitely important aspect. Um, let me pull that back up. Because almost always, again and again and again, you'll find the Virgin Mary shown with a shaft of wheat, either in her hand or near oh. her. Or, Somewhere nearby, yes. Or a cherub is, let me see, Renaissance. How do you spell Renaissance? R-A-I-N. Oh, no, R-E-N-A-I-S-S-A-N-C-E. -S Sorry. Yeah. Try that. Renaissance art, Virgin Mary. Uh, I want images. Um, and a, a ridiculous amount of times you'll see the Virgin Mary with wheat or a cherub is about to hand her a shaft of wheat or somewhere in the image. Uh, these ones aren't... Sh oh, look, here, here's one showing some... Uh, those it's not really wheat. Um, where did they go? I had a whole bunch. Yeah, I know. I I, I used to have a whole collection of these, and I don't know where the folder went. Yeah, that's why. I, the assumption. I, here it is. I saw you. See, why did it give me this? I clicked on the assumption. The Assumption of Mary, and that's not what I want. Jeez. I never use Google. I'm a duck duck person all the way. The Assumption of Mary. Here you go. Here's a good one. Here's a good example. Again, we have 12 cherubs. If you count the cherubs that are full-bodied with faces, not, not the little faces in the clouds, but the the cherubs that have full bodies and faces, there are 12 in total. So there's your 12 constellations. And look here on Mary's left hand, cherub is handing her a shaft of wheat. This is known as the Assumption of Mary. That's Fair. all for you. And will the serpent be close to him? He's also holding a reef or something. Um, he, he, is yeah, holding, he, is. he is holding a reef. See, there's, there's two shafts of wheat. There's one on the other side as well, uh, near the, the, the angel, which is next to this one, uh, away from uh, Mary. He, there's also a shaft of wheat coming out of that one. 
And that's like two stars. You see? Um, no, which other one? So, so, so the one who's holding the shaft of wheat, and then you just go go down to the right, downwards, and that other guy oh. is also holding. Yeah, right there. Yep. Yeah, I see it. Euchus, for the Egyptian of Euchus. Well, a vague, abstract uh, ideal idea, uh, a representation, sort of 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 Euchus. <laughs> That's very interesting. I didn't know this stuff. So again, I mean, this is a, a different version, Assumption of the Blessed Mary. If you count all these people or cherubs, there's three there, there's three there in groups. And, and, and the three and the three, those are representations of, of the months, of the seasons. So there's six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, there's a, a faint figure back there, eleven. And there's a hand down here, so there's another one. This is cropped off, so there's your 12. Wow. And it wouldn't surprise me if there was very subtly embedded... I don't see that, this. That, that hand is holding up something where it's cropped off. I'm not sure it looks um, more like holly than it does wheat, but... Yeah. That will surely also be in the zodiac. Is there any holly or, or reef or something in, in the regular zodiac? Well, the holly and the wreath, um, those are all representations of harvest and, and fertility because we're talking about harvesting crops. And, and things of that nature so you're always going to see something of that kind something of that nature involved um, I used to have a I, I don't know where it went I don't know where it and I don't want to waste you guys time for me to go and find it but I had a whole folder with uh, at least two dozen images of the Virgin Mary that had the moon at her feet with shafts of wheat trampling a serpent 12 cherubs again and again and again in the clouds in the sky in the stars over and over and over yeah i remember you showing me all of those and again charles um color is symbolic it's important so if you look at the colors that mary is depicted with you have three colors you have the white which is purity you have blue which is water women are always associated with water because when a woman is pregnant her water breaks when you know every baby is born through water so women are always associated with water um, she's white because she's pure and she's blue because of the water and those are women colors and then occasionally you'll see her depicted in pink or red because of the the monthly flow that women have to go through so there is that association with women in blood true and so whenever you look at images of the Virgin Mary, look at the colors. They're always white, red, and blue. Red, blue, red, and white. Red, white, and blue. Always. Always, always. Just like I was saying about Judas Iscariot, he's always yellow, red, orange. So these colors are important. Always. Look at all these images of the Virgin Mary. All of them. Red, white, or blue. Red and blue. Or white and blue. Red and blue. White and blue always this is not an accident anyway uh, I'll leave it there so yeah Charles um <clears throat> spend some time on the uh, Thunderbolts project and yeah, you inspired me to do that to check out some of their videos um, yeah I highly recommend them and and suspicious observers, even though they, like I mentioned earlier, I don't know whether they got caught on the live stream or not. For some reason, there's 
some animosity between the electric universe and the plasma universe, even though they seem to be pretty much the same as uh, far as their science is concerned. Is that because of the controversy over the inventor of the electric universe? I have no idea. Like I said, I, I do not know why mm -hmm. there is such animosity. Uh, because there's not just Onil and uh, Parat and all that. There's also a Hungarian bloke also came up with it uh, differently and independently uh, some years earlier. Um, was it, so maybe that's the plasmauniverse.net. Is that what it is? Um, I don't. I don't know what the website is. I just watch Suspicious Observers. Ah, I see. Thank you. And that just for your information, observers is uh spelt with a zero not a an o okay so it's suspicious zero observers <laughs> and the other thing electric universe it's it's kind of almost like a trademark of, of fornil and co and plasma universe is the term used by eric Lerner in his uh 1980s book the big bang never happened in which he's championing the electric universe and the, i don't know if you've read that book it's, it's bloody yes, long What's it, what's it called? The uh, Big, the Big Bang, Bang never happened. And the Big yet. Bang never happened. And that book, it, 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 all the electric universe seems to sprout, a lot of it seems to sprout out of that book. Um, and, and this guy was pushing the, the electric universe in the 80s. Now he's working on getting funding to build a fusion reactor, if you look him up. Um, yeah. Hmm. Uh, so yeah. So um, yeah, yeah. That, but that book, that's that's a great book, and that taught me a lot about Electric Universe. But it is dare, it is so long and a bit repetitive as well. And he's always he's trashing cosmology, he's trashing the Big Bang, and he says, look, it needs to be laboratory done. And he's totally correct. Yeah. He's abs he's absolutely right because uh, plasma experiments, electrical experiments, are scalable up to an enormous number of orders of magnitude. So everything from a laboratory experiment all the way up to a galactic scale, we can replicate with electrical and plasma phenomenon from a laboratory all the way up to, to galactic or even larger than galactic scale up, up to an entire nebulous. And I, I'm, I'm in agreement that the Big Bang never happened. I am not a proponent of Big Bang. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with Halton Arp. Halton Arp... Oh, yeah. Are you? Yeah. Are you? It's the quasars, yeah? Yeah. Um, Halton Arp was Edwin Hubble's assistant, and Halton Arp took over the observatory when Hubble left and retired. So Edwin Hubble is the guy famous for detecting redshift. Okay. The redshift uh, observation was, it was, his thesis was that it was the expansion of the universe. It was a Doppler effect of light. Okay, so he was he postulated that that uh, the things that he was observing were moving further away faster, and they were more red shifted, and that's why they were getting the red shift. He was they were postulating it was the Doppler effect of light. Well, Halton Arp, who was his own assistant, comes along and blows that theory out of the water with his observations. Yeah. <laughs> so, and and if I'm not mistaken, before. Hubble died, uh, he's actually quoted as, as refuting his own findings. So the redshift, the Doppler effect of light, the redshift observations that show the supposed expansion of the universe is false. So, yes. <laughs> yep. so, so without the expansion, we don't have contraction. If you don't wind the clock backwards, we don't have the Big Bang. So mm. the Big Bang never, never did happen. I, I'm, a, I'm on board with that. It, yeah, this, me too. It, yeah, this was also a theory. You know, Fred Hoyle, who was, uh, I, don't think he, I don't know if he got the Nobel Prize or he was nominated, but he was a brilliant mathematician. He wrote about Stonehenge, about the eclipses as well, that it was an eclipse computer. And uh, he was a, just a, he, also a panspermia guy, and he, he was a physicist. And he said the, he, he, he championed the solid state universe. And he also said they buggered up the experiments on Mars, the life experiments, uh, and, they, they, and they should have concluded that it looks like there is life because there was a release of gas from these rocks. 
uh, to show that. But anyway, he, he championed the solid state universe. He said the ice ages are a bunch of crap because uh, the, the, the so-called Milankovic cycles are rubbish. Uh, I really respect the guy, but yeah, he, uh, he came up with a solid state idea which has fallen out of favor. And he said the light could be simply absorbed by the absorbed by things along the way. So that's that's what this red shift is. And I agree with that. I think the light is being absorbed by maybe dark matter or just no, dust. not dark matter. There is no such thing as dark matter. What, what they're fi- what they're finding is that there's a lot of matter that we didn't see before because we weren't looking at it right. They've started looking in other bandwidths and going. Holy Toledo, look at all this matter. Well, so plasma, it, they're, not, they're saying now that plasma makes up 99.9% of all the matter in the universe. And they came up with this theory of dark matter, which has yet to be observed or proven or demonstrated. And they came up with this theory to explain the anomalies that their standard model cannot explain. Yep. Which is the force of gra- uh, with the force of, of electromagnetism. Yeah. Exactly right. Exactly right. The absence of electromagnetism. Uh, see, see, the absence of electromagnetism in conventional theories creates a hole because there's not enough mass to to move things around because the whole skew of conventional cosmology is gravity is bending and warping everything in the universe and there's not enough gravity to explain Mm -hmm. all the folds and everything which is where electric universe must come in right yeah yep yeah so dark dark matter and dark energy is bunk it's it's fudge factor because their models don't work yep they say oh gosh we got to plug something in here to make it work what shall we call it oh let's call it dark matter Let's call it dark energy. Yep, it's horseshit. And by the way, Aaron, I wanted to mention to you that I I fully and a hundred percently agree with you that the ether is the electrogravito magnetic field that pervades the universe. And it explains why in electrogravitics they noticed that there was a variation in the amount of power gotten depending on the time of day, which would be explained by the galactic energies and the way they relate to the spinning earth. And that is why I have decided you're absolutely right. (laughs) Oh, thanks. You're welcome. (laughs) And you know, Charles, if Velikovsky was correct... If the Bible story of the sun standing still in the sky for more than a day and the stories and mythologies on the other side of the earth say that they had an extended nighttime period, if that's correct, then that means that the earth slowed down in its its rotation, not orbit, but rotation, slowed down temporarily probably due to a close encounter with another large planetary body like Venus, a close encounter. Now, imagine for a minute the the mass and inertia. Earth is supposed to be rotating at a thousand miles an hour at the equator. Imagine trying to put the brakes on that. What would happen? The crustal plates would crash into each other the oceans would come out of their basins that would account for yeah, they'd keep going <laughs> that, would, that would account for the flood myth that would account for all kinds of catastrophic apocalyptic mythologies yes. by by the way in, in the plasma universe as presented by suspicious observers there's some evidence that that uh hesitation in the rotation is relative to the uh, magnetic pole flip. Right. Which we're seeing as we speak. (laughs) So. This has been a blast. Uh, Charles, what do you want to add here before we close it out? Because I've kept you long enough. Uh... 
I just want to say that was absolutely amazing because we covered uh, every topic there is. <laughs> <laughs> Bigfoot to uh, to transatlantic. We covered um, yeah, we covered it. We covered it all and electric universe as well, which is a, just a brilliant a brilliant topic, a magnificent topic. Yeah. Right. Well, um, again, finally, I would just urge you one more time to. You know, take into consideration this uh, astrology and astrotheological perspective when you're doing your assessments because it plays such an important role in the ancient life of cultures around the world. Every culture venerated the gods as planets, as stars, the sun, the moon. Everything that was happening in the sky was so important to these people. And that's why they. All the carvings and petroglyphs and hieroglyphs, uh, monuments and structures and buildings were all constructed based on stuff that was happening in the sky. So uh, for me, that, that's, that's my main filter. Every time I look at something, I, it goes through that filter first. Well, yeah, you, you, fair enough. Because uh, it was it was like a photograph. It, they want to preserve something that was extraordinary forever. So, for sure, that, that that is a very good theory. Well, I got a friend who wants to join us, but I'm going to close this out, and maybe we'll, I'll do a sh an after show stream, or we can chat privately offline. Charles, if you want to hang around, feel free to. Um, yeah. If you have stuff to do, then thank you for your time, and we love you, and I can't wait to talk to you again. It was great catching up with you. Um, but I'm going to invite my friend uh, Killendale in here, um, somebody I've known for a little while, and he, he's a good guy, and he's got some in, and interesting stuff that, that I'm sure he can add to the conversation. Um, and like I said, if you, if you want to hang around and see what he has to say, um, feel free, and, and I may just go ahead and close this and start a new stream, and I'll call it the after show or whatever. Um, but thanks, Charles, and uh, let's close it out, and we'll go final thoughts, everybody. Is Gandalf still with us? Did he have to leave? Yeah, he left. Gandalf left. So, Amy, final thoughts. Amy. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. I thought I had my mic down, and I didn't. Uh, love always. And check out my channel, my work. Let's make this planet better than it is now. Indeed. Charles, final thoughts, sir. Well, thank you for having me on my program. I've, I've, I think we've all learned a lot from each other. I've learned uh, a, a huge amount, especially about Virgo and about, about the constellation, astrotheology. Thank you so much for having me. I hope to do it again soon. Well, it's been a real pleasure, and we do love you around here. And as always, my final thoughts are always the same. Be good to each other and pick up your trash. And uh, with that, I'll, for anybody who's still watching, and if you care, then our upcoming shows, we have Global Agenda next week, and I'm pretty sure we have Annie Logical the week after that. Yeah. Yes, and, we definitely have Annie Logical the week following that. Okay, so... Uh, thanks everybody for checking us out and I do apologize for my internet interruption uh, but uh, it is what it is it's um, it's a free show so hey yeah there you go shit happens and thanks everybody we do love you and we will check you guys out next week and if you want uh, come back in a few minutes because I'm probably gonna start restreaming in just a minute I'm gonna get Killendale in Hill in here and uh, see what he wants to talk about. Uh, but uh, well, I'm going to close it out. Thanks. Thanks, Charles. You're brilliant as always. Thanks. Yeah. Start streaming.